All right, well, it is uh, 6.30, and so we will go ahead and begin, and I assume that others will also join as they are able. Um, again, you have um, in front of you um, a survey with multiple choice um, questions, and we're asking those who come on and join now if they would please put A, B, C, D, or E in the chat portion of your Zoom screen so we can collect those responses. Well, I would like to welcome you to this first uh, edition in our pandemic form series uh, programs tonight. I'm Deacon Gail Britt. I'm the Minister of Hope and Healing for Shepherd of the Valley Lutheran as well as American Lutheran Church in Grand Junction. And I will be your facilitator tonight. Um, we're so glad that you have taken this time to join us for this very vital presentation. Uh, just a little bit about our series in general. Our next five Tuesday evenings are going to be presentations um, developed to help inform and educate and guide us in our physical, uh, mental, and spiritual health to nurture hope and healing in the midst of a pandemic. Um, if uh, you are, before I uh, uh, continue, if anyone is um, not um, muted, you need to mute yourself, if you will, or Matthew will be able to do that. And that will help us so we don't have a lot of background noise during um, the presentation. Um, so uh, the series is, is, is developed to help guide and nurture our uh, mental, spiritual, and physical health. Uh, to promote health and healing during a pandemic. So before we begin officially, I have a few housekeeping notes to keep in mind, if you will. Um, for the most part, you're going to be muted throughout the program, with the exception of question and answer segments that are going to be happening throughout. Um, so there's going to be a slide that Dr. Muller will put up, which shows raised hands, all right? So the slide of raised hands lets you know we're getting into a question and answer break, right? So what you would need to do if you would like to be live and ask your question live, you may do so. Just raise your hand, then Matthew will unmute you, and then you can go ahead and ask your question. Now, for those who don't want to do that and would rather do it in the chat, you can certainly type your question in the chat. Um, and that will sort of guide you when you see that slide with the raised hands, okay? Um, and so um, there's going to be four uh, specific topics or areas that are gonna be discussed by Dr. Muller tonight. Uh, the first will be the coronavirus variants. Uh, the second topic will be herd immunity. The third will be incentives, uh, mandates, and passports. And the fourth will be the post-vaccine era. Okay, so those will be uh, question and answer breaks. So keep in mind the questions that you might have um, for some of those questions that are coming up and some of the answers that Dr. Muller will give us. Um, and so please also note that uh, tonight, determining, determining the number of questions that might come up in chat and live, um, we may go over an hour uh, in duration and we can do that tonight. However, if you have to go, that is fine. Just go ahead and you can leave the meeting, um, but we will continue on um, for a time and try to answer, Dr. Muller will try to answer all the questions that come up. Um, and now I'd like to uh, introduce our guest presenter tonight. Dr. Phil Muller uh, practiced yeah, family funny, medicine in Grand Junction for over 40 years. Um, serves as the medical director for Mesa County Public Health and Rocky Mountain Health Plans. And uh, Dr. Malora has also cared for the homeless 
for patients with COVID um, over this pandemic. He's also a member of American Lutheran Church. So please join me in welcoming, welcoming Dr. Phil Moeller. Welcome, Dr. Moeller. Thank you so thank much. You. Well, thank you so much, and thank you all for um, giving up your your Tuesday evening, at least here for an hour or so. Um, that the the way I titled this talk was navigating uncharted waters, and one of the themes that you'll see coming through again and again are questions that you ask me where I, was, I said I don't know, and, and then a lot of the questions that I'll actually pose on on the the slides and you're about to endure uh, uh, death by PowerPoint, you, you'll notice there are a lot of unanswered questions. And so in some ways, this may be the most unsatisfying um, talk that, that I've ever put together. Um, on the other hand, I, I hope that it does try to clarify um, some of the issues that, that are heavy on your minds and hearts. Um, Let's see, helps if you run it in the right direction. So um, first of all, I'll, I'll just show you uh, my disclosures. And as Deacon Gale pointed out, I, I do work for Rocky Mountain Health Plans and I, uh, I'm the medical director at, uh, at our local health department. And, and certainly if uh, some of the things I say may not fit with uh, what, what uh, some of my bosses might say, and so these these are my own uh, opinions. And please please don't go tell my boss. Um, you know, as I just said, there are a lot of unanswered questions about this pandemic. Uh, you know, I put this talk together about three weeks ago, and during that time, I changed a lot of the things. And some of the things that I've changed, I put in red bold print to kind of show you how much this is in flux. Um, and, and you all know that if you watch the evening news or, or read, read the newspaper. Um, you know, one of my heroes in life is, was um, Sir William Osler. And he said, medicine is a science of uncertainty and an art of probability. And, and it's almost like he, knew what was coming uh, with this because we've had lots of, lots of uncertainty. Um, wanna talk just a minute about vaccine development because it's, you know, one of the criticisms has been is how fast this happened and did they do the right things? And, you know, the vaccines that have come into being during my career have developed, you know, over years and in years. Um, I, I've been a frequent critic of the FDA about how they handle uh, the introduction of new drugs. Uh, I think they've not always done a good job. But when you talk about what they've done with uh, vaccine development, it really has been, and I use the word stellar and, and I really mean that. Uh, they've done a great job of ensuring vaccine safety. So their track record there is real good. Um, the other thing I would point out to you uh, is that how well drugs and vaccines work in clinical trials is often significantly better than it is in the real world. You know, for example, one of the downsides of having a two shot um, vaccine is whether you're talking about shingles or you're talking about COVID is that people don't end up for various reasons getting the second dose. The really good news is, is out of Israel in the last 10 days where they've been using the Pfizer vaccine. Uh, the Israelis have been really good about getting the vaccine distributed to lots of members. And, and the results there that they're seeing are as good as, as what we saw in the clinical trials you know, the 90, 95% effectiveness against, against COVID disease. So that's good news. Um, you know, was the vaccine rolled out in a rush fashion? It sure was, it was at warp speed. But, but the good news is that the testing was done. It was just compressed. 
Usually when you're testing a new drug or a new vaccine, you have a phase where you study what the dose should be. You do phases where you look at uh, safety of, of, of the vaccines. And, and usually they run these sequentially. Uh, you run one and then another, and then 18 months later, you run another. These were all done at the same time. They were done simultaneously. So it really cut down on the amount of time. The other thing that was going on was that millions of doses of vaccine were actually manufactured before the drug companies even knew if they worked or not. And so, for example, Merck, the company in the United States that's been most successful in producing vaccines over the years, uh, you know, had, a, had an utter failure. You know, it was an utter failure that was supported in large part by the federal government. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, you know, their attempt and they produced a whole lot of a vaccine uh, uh, that I think probably was thrown away. You know, why did it all work? It was because the federal government decided to throw big money at this and, and, and big money makes things happen. Um, if there's one thing that I guess I would ask you all to remember tonight, if there's one slide, it would be this one. And this is really the good news. And, you know, there are five vaccines that we may end up with in this country. You know about Pfizer and Moderna, and you know about Johnson & Johnson that just been approved in the last few days. And then there's AstraZeneca and, uh, and, and Novavax. So in those, for those five drugs, in their clinical trials, about 75,000 people got those vaccines, one of those five vaccines. And here's the good news. No one of those 75,000 people died of COVID and very few of them got hospitalized. If you took 75,000 adult Americans and who got, ended up getting COVID illness, 150 of them would be dead and hundreds of them would end up being in the hospital. So I, I think, you know, if you he, remember nothing else, remember that what we've been given here is, is really a super blessing. Uh, it's an amazing blessing in terms of vaccines and we'll talk about variants and sometimes that, you know, that gets our mind kind of in a twist, but th this is really the, the bottom line and the, the take home I'd have for you all. Um, I, I put this together just to remind you about the three vaccines that you might run into if you are a candidate and decide that you wanna get uh, the vaccine. You know, the Pfizer and Moderna are the, are the two vaccines on the left and then the new Johnson and Johnson vaccine. Uh, you know, Pfizer and Moderna, as you know, are the mRNA vaccines that, you know, the, really the wonder, uh, vaccines of, of all times in terms of how quickly they were developed. Uh, the mRNA um, technology has been sitting on the shelf for a long time, never has been widely used with a vaccine, and now we have it. The Johnson & Johnson vaccine is different. It uses a, a weakened adenovirus, a cold virus is sort of the vehicle. As you all know, it's a single dose. And the really, you know, if you look at this pandemic from a worldwide setting, and I, I want you to think beyond Grand Junction and Colorado and the United States tonight, because that's really where it's gonna be about, but it's, it's a wonderful vaccine in terms of the fact that it can be stored for three months in a regular refrigerator, and it's stable in a regular freezer for a couple of years. You know, the next line in terms of efficacy I think unfortunately much has been made of this and these vaccines have, have never been compared head to head. And you certainly can't compare the efficacy of Pfizer and Moderna with the Johnson and Johnson vaccine. They're different in the sense that they measure different things. The Johnson and Johnson vaccine only measured people uh, preventing uh, 
really moderate to the severe illness. Um, and so markedly different in terms of that. The other thing that we know is that it, uh, Johnson & Johnson vaccine was tested against the South African variant that we'll talk some about. And, and that makes it really impossible to, to compare these. Um, they all now are operating a, a, available under a EUA and emergency uh, usage uh, uh, situation. So let's stop for a minute and some questions and maybe, I don't know, Matthew, do you have a summary of where people are about their, uh, their own feeling about the vaccines? Uh, yeah, I switched the thing the right way. Um, most people were on E where they have had uh, both doses. Um, is it possible for you to bring the questions back up? Because I only wrote down if it was A, B, C, D, or E. Yeah. Um, all right, so um, no A's, um, a few, uh, just one or two B's, but mainly it was E or C. Okay, great. So it's like preaching to the, preaching to the choir. It's over 50%, probably yeah. over 75% was E. Okay. Great. What what other questions do you all have at this point? Um, speaking of questions, I do not have the ability to unmute. I only have the ability to mute you. So if you have questions, please do uh, unmute yourself. Okay, and I can't see the chat. Anything in the chat? If not, we'll... Okay, I have a question. Can you hear me? I can. Oh, good. Okay. Um, I'm in a quilt group in town and we meet once a month and we have refreshments. Now in the past, well, before COVID, we just set out our refreshments and everybody helped themselves. And now um, what's happening is everybody, when they, it's their turn oh. to refreshments, they bring them and they're all packaged in like little sandwich baggies or whatever. And do we we have to continue wrapping things that way. Well, I, you know, I guess my answer to that early on last um, April and May, every, every time I got groceries from the grocery store, I wiped them all down. Right. Um, after about a month, after what I'd read, I, I think the whole issue of, of, getting the disease from contact from inanimate objects is really, really low. And, and so, you know, I still try to wash my hands a bunch, but in terms of wrapping things up, I, you know, or worrying about that, I guess I would not. I would be more concerned about, um, A, whether or not the other folks in your group have been immunized, B, what the room is like in terms of ventilation, uh, how close, you know, whether you're using social distancing, uh, whether you use, wear masks while you're together. Um, I do have together. some lamb steaks out if you want that. Uh, we, are, um, we are social distancing at our tables. We are wearing masks, but of course, when people get their refreshments, then they take their masks off in order to eat. Mm -hmm. So I just want to know if we still have to wrap all the food up individually. You're kind of, and I don't know about the ventilation. I mean, okay. well, I would be more concerned about the ventilation than how the food was wrapped. I okay. guess that would be my yeah. response. And, you know, and if it's a situation where you can open the door, 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 improve the ventilation, particularly until everybody in the group is, is immunized, that, that would seem to be right. prudent. And we're probably a mixture of where we're, we're at with being um, uh, immunized. Probably a mixture. Some people have had both. Some people maybe have wet one. I don't really know. Uh-huh. And that, that would be something to talk about. I, you know, and we'll talk some more about you know, in a church setting, you know, what should be the requirements? 
you know, part part of my angst about this is that in in Grand Junction here in the last three or four months, we've had 12 outbreaks related to church activities. Right. And they were things like like you described, small groups, you know, not not a lot of people infected, but certainly where the church setting was was the site of the problem. Mm -hmm. Other questions? All right, well, let, let's go ahead and talk about um, variants. Um, hopefully I won't get in over my head. I'm not a vir virologist, but you know, a sort of a simple way to think about it is a virus's job is to get into a host and a host could be an animal or a plant or a human being. Um, and create copies of itself and then spread to other hosts. You know, if technically viruses really aren't alive, they are depending upon a host, you know, for their existence. Um, as I wrote this, I thought about some Gregorian um, monk copying things as, you know, as viruses replicate, they make small copying errors and these are known as mutation. This is what shows up then in, in their genes, in their genetic makeup. And we know that the COVID virus is a coronavirus. It's a, it's a uh, virus in the family that gives us most of our wintertime upper respiratory infections. And, and coronaviruses typically have random mutations, you know, one or two, maybe three a, a month, just randomly. Um, viruses with these mutations then are what are called variants, the word that we've learned to use. And we know that variants, um, you know, emerge all the time. A lot of them just simply emerge and then disappear. Uh, other times variants emerge and they persist. Um, you know, and so if you, if you end up with a variant with a, with a characteristic on the virus, that helps it do its job better, uh, then it's, it's more likely to persist. It's more likely to stick around. And what we think, and we talk about both uh, the South African variants and the British variants is that we think that the variants there occurred, the, the changes in the gen gen genetic makeup occurred to help the virus hang on to the to the receptors that are in our nose, what are called ACE2 receptors. You know, the nose is primarily the place where uh, we get the virus and, and, and often where, you know, where the virus is, is spread to others from. Um, you know, in early February, 2020, uh, we had the first United Kingdom and try not to call it the United Kingdom virus like, like our former president called it the, the Chinese virus, but it was first identified in the United Kingdom. And um, we had our first case of the B117 virus in a, in a young woman uh, tested at the Mesa County Fairgrounds. She had no symptoms. She had not traveled. Then later in February, mid-February, we had, um, the same variant was identified on the CMU uh, campus. So the variants um, are, are alive um, and, and well in, in Happy Valley. Um, you know, the Colorado Department of Health, uh, you know, has been conducting surveillance of variants since December. We sort of got into the game late. The real, you know, the real, smart people about this are the Brits. The Brits have done a great job at looking at variants. And so when you want to uh, uh, take something home about variants, if it's um, based on what the work that's been done in, in uh, the UK, it, it's really a, a, a good place to look. Um, as of last uh, Friday, um, the our state Public Health Laboratory said we have uh, 190 cases of the B117, that's the UK 
variant. We have 88 cases of the, the variant that's linked to the outbreaks in California. And as, as of March 5th, there were no other variants. Uh, variants are described as variants of concern. Variants of concern are ones that we think may spread more easily or, or be more deadly. Uh, but at that point, there were no other uh, variants um, in, in Colorado under investigation. Um, Dr. Fauci, who's uh, one of my heroes, you know, predicts that the, the UK variant will likely become the dominant variant in the United States. And as of yesterday, I, I saw one report suggest that about 20% of the new cases occurring right now in, in our country uh, are, are this British, um, uh, the, the UK variant, the B117. So just today, um, our Colorado Department of Public Health and Environment reported, um, you know, three cases of, uh, of a variant. This was uh, identified at the Buena Vista uh, Correctional Complex. It involved two staff and one incarcerated person. Uh, this is the first detection of, of this uh, variant in Colorado, although it's been identified in 20 other states. Um, and this, this is the variant uh, that has been described as the South, uh, the variant that was first described in South Africa. Uh, we're fairly certain now that this variant spreads more readily, uh, able to grab onto those ACE2, ACE2 receptors in our nose more easily. Um, and, and there is concern because uh, this variant has shown some resistance uh, to some of the vaccines. And we'll, we'll talk some more about that. Um, you know, initially there wasn't really any evidence that the variants cause more severe illness or uh, increase the risk of death. Um, and then, the British, uh, the middle of last month, uh, their health committee called NerveTag released a preliminary report suggesting that the British variant was indeed more likely to result in hospitalization and death than the non-British uh, variant. And I would just tell you that these data are incomplete and, and maybe even more importantly than their incompleteness is that the size effect is small. In other words, um, when something is just you know, only slightly more effective, it may, it may not even reach the point of being uh, clinically important. But, but data now that's being collected in, in England where they're really tuned in to, uh, uh, to studying uh, variants. Um, in South Africa here uh, a few weeks ago, they stopped distributing the AstraZeneca vaccine because it didn't prevent mild or moderate COVID disease uh, caused by that South African variant that we've just now reporting here in Colorado. And you know, one thing that is somewhat troubling is in South Africa, some folks had uh, the variant back in the summer or the fall. Um, and what we know now is that these folks have gotten reinfected again uh, by the South African variant. And they did not seem to have protection against that variant from, from the native disease that they, they got earlier in the year. Uh, this has been reported. And again, you know, I think you have to take it with a grain of salt. Uh, that you know, there are no real peer-reviewed studies of this, but, but that's the reporting as of today. Um, you know, I think the really good news: the UN has approved the emergency use of the AstraZeneca vaccine, and this is really, really important because this vaccine is is dirt cheap um, and has good handling capabilities. It doesn't take cold, cold freezers. Uh, to keep it. And so, you know, we may not see a lot of AstraZeneca vaccine in the United States, but we're really dependent upon the whole world licking this problem. And, 
And so the fact that the UN has moved forward to that, I think is really a, a great sign. Um, what does it all mean? It means that we're in a race right now. And the more and more people that we can immunize, the, quick, the quicker we can do it, the less chance the virus has to mutate, the less chance it has to jump to a new host and mutate further and change further and potentially become resistant um, to the vaccines we have. You know, we uh, in the United States and, and you know, I've always been a champion of, of public health you know, public health has been, um, you know, the redheaded stepchild forever in the United States, you know, and this is another arena in terms of looking for variants where we've been really uh, far behind. I think our new head of the CDC, Rochelle Walensky, has, um, you know, really vowed to get us back in the ballpark because genetic sequencing now is really going to be very important to figure out what, you know, what's happening in the world uh, so that we can build new, new vaccines quickly. And with the mRNA technology, you know, this is pretty simple. Uh, you can build the, the new vaccine in two or three days if you know uh, what, what you're looking for. And then it's a problem simply of manufacturing it and getting it, um, getting it dispersed. So the immediate short-term solution to decrease the spread of the variant disease is, it's a message from God, is it a vaccine, a miracle, a gift from heaven? No, for right now, it's, it's wearing a mask. And um, I think you know, that's <laughs> the take home message now, whether you've been fully immunized, partly immunized or waiting in the wings, uh, it, it's, not, not to burn your mask like some folks have been doing in the last week. So let's stop and talk about variants. Um, questions or comments? I'm interested in your thoughts. May I ask you, I have just tried ivermectin. What is your thoughts on it? Um, you know, I have a lot of experience with ivermectin. Uh, we had an outbreak in one local facility here in town and as part of the public health. It works great for scabies. Um, I don't know any good science that it um, is effective. You were, you were taking it as a preventive measure or you thought you had COVID or why were you taking it? As a preventive. Yeah. I, I, I am not aware of any science suggesting its efficacy. <clears throat> okay. Thank you. Yep. Other questions? Um, Dr. Mueller, there was a, a question, um, it was related to the vaccine, but um, it wasn't mentioned, it was in the chat. Uh, regarding um, breastfeeding and pregnancy for pregnant women, there really hasn't been that many tests um, that have been done that I'm aware of, and I just wanted to confirm that. Or um, what about taking the vaccine if you're breastfeeding um, pregnant? What are your thoughts yeah. on that? Well, you know, at least the studies, the mRNA uh, vaccines specifically excluded uh, women that knew they were pregnant. Um, as it turns out right now, some 10,000, this is quoting Dr. Fauci, some 10,000 pregnant women have, have gotten the vaccine. And, and to date, we know nothing ill about women getting that. One of the downsides for pregnant women, you know, pregnant women are at high risk. Five to 6% of pregnant women who get COVID end up being hospitalized and they get really sick. And, and so to me, this is one of the things where you're balancing some unknown potential risk against, um, against what is known is if you get the disease and you're pregnant, you, you can be in for a rough, rough time. I think you know both the American College of OBGYN 
and an American Academy of Family Practice, you know, suggests that both for pregnant women and for breastfeeding women, that it's an appropriate uh, thing to do. You know, and historically, uh, you know, I think, you know, it's like with flu vaccine that we've used. And again, you know, pregnant women who get to get influenza have a more difficult time. You know, we've always recommended uh, that vaccine uh, for ladies who are pregnant or breastfeeding. Okay, questions? if there are no other questions. Um, I, I, go on. I, I do have another one. Um, okay. Um, there has been some um, discussion around um, why is it that a percentage, a fairly decent percentage of first responders um, and healthcare workers have not elected to uh, get the vaccine, any of the vaccines. And I wonder if you could comment on that. Um, yeah, I, I, and I think the answer is a whole lot of different answers, you know, and it might depend upon, um, uh, you know, some, some skepticism about the process, uh, you know, that we talked about that was markedly speeded up, you know, and I would tell you in my heart of hearts, you know, I'm a person who used to tell folks, uh, you know, who'd come in and they saw the new drug advertised on the late show uh, last night, and they wanted that new uh, $300 drug because it was going to fix all their problems. And, you know, and my stance about that was, you know, wait till the drug's been on the market for seven years and then come back and we'll talk again. Um, I, you know, we don't have the, the benefit of that, but I think, you know, that's part of the issue. If you're a, a person of color, you may still remember the experiments that were done at Tuskegee in the South where black men were given syphilis and then not, not treated. And so, you know, some distrust of of the government, some distrust of medical science and in general. Um, I, I, think, I think there are a significant number of healthcare workers who um, are playing wait and see. Uh, I'll wait and see what happens in, in the next year. We know, for example, in Grand Junction, we had a significant number of deaths in our nursing homes. Um, but at this point in time, the nursing homes in Grand Junction, the folks who survived uh, COVID, you know, most all of the residents in nursing homes have been uh, immunized. On the other hand, if you look at the non-registered nurse staff, only about two thirds of those folks opted to take the vaccine. You know, some of that I think is based on age. When you look at studies that uh, how well people are, are uh, willing to take the vaccine, you get a bunch of people like me and it's almost unanimous. Everybody wants it and I want it yesterday. If you talk to um, uh, 18 to 20 year olds, like my two of my grandchildren, uh, you know, they're not, they're a little bit skeptical of the whole situation. So I, I it's not a very good answer, Gail, but I think it's, I, I think there's not one answer. Um, and it's troubling. Um, I think if you're somebody who is being cared for by a healthcare worker and you've not been immunized and you know they could have been, uh, that, that may create some, some ill feelings. Okay, yeah, thank you for that. Um, also, um, Pastor Valerie um, mentions in the chat that she has a friend who wonders about um, any information for those who wish to have more children um, and vac vaccination effects for those who are thinking of expanding their families as well. Yeah, yeah I think, you know, this, you know, the mRNA vaccines don't fiddle with your DNA. They never get into that part of the cell. And I think, so I think there is, you know, A, we don't have 20 years of experience, but we know how the Pfizer and Moderna vaccines work. 
and you know the RNA that's used as the messenger, the, the vehicle simply disappears from the body. It, it gets into the cell, but it doesn't get into the part of the cell where our DNA, what, what makes our kids of the future. So I, I think there should be a lot of optimism. And I, I think, you know, I think that would not be a significant worry that I would have about my, my grandchildren having, having kids. Okay, thank you. Um, any other questions? that anyone has at this time. Okay. Well, let's go on and talk a little bit about herd immunity. Uh, uh, Bert and Ernie are talking about it. And uh, this, this is an article that, that I found in the Atlantic a couple of months ago. And, and it's the work of um, Dr. Levine, a biologist at Emory. And she likens herd immunity to wet logs in a campfire. And she says, if there's enough water in the logs, if there's enough immunity in a population, you can't get the fire to start, period, she says. So let, let's talk a little bit about that. We'll talk about what's called the reproduction number. And I promise not to get, go very far into the math here, but basically the reproduction number measures the spread of an infectious disease. <clears throat> it's the average number of people that get infected from one person in a, in a susceptible population where you haven't done any intervention. So it, it's kind of a measure, and I'll show you a table in a minute that maybe you'll make that clearer. And if you wanna prevent uh, spread of a disease, then you need to get the reproduction number down to less than one. Uh, if you get it down to less than one, then, then you essentially have herd immunity. You know, obviously with, with COVID or with measles or with uh, SARS or whatever infectious illness you wanna talk about, the, the, the reproduction number varies widely depending on you know, uh, what country you're in, what culture you're in, what stage of the outbreak. You know, the reproduction number here in Mesa County it is varied a whole lot. And you get some feeling about the reproduction number if you look at you know, how many cases have occurred in the last couple of weeks. You know, a great number to think about, and I, I didn't see the data for today, but yesterday we only reported two new cases in Mesa County, you know, hallelujah. And so you would guess that the reproduction number was, was in a state of falling. In, in general, the reproduction number for COVID has been in the two to four, uh, two to four persons get get infected by a single person who gets, gets the disease. And so here, here's the table I wanted to show you. And, and it compares there in the left-hand column, uh, you know, things like measles and whooping cough, and you can drop down and see influenza from 1918, describes how it's transmitted. And then that, that center column about average number of new uh, infections caused by each case, that's the reproduction number. So let, you know, the, the thing that always gets talked about when you talk about herd immunity is, is measles, because measles has an unbelievable, if you put measles into a classroom or measles into a business or measles into a church uh, and people aren't immunized, uh, you know, 12 to 18 people get it from, from each person who, who starts off with the infection. And so, you know, the, the, the reproduction number then you can see is markedly related then to how many people you have to get uh, immunized to, to, to shut down a, 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 an epidemic or a pandemic. So with measles, it's up in the 92 to 95 range. You know, in, in, and just for another example, you know, in some of our grade schools here in Mesa County, we have immunization rates uh, for measles that are in the 70 to 80 percent range. And so you can see if, if, um, if measles comes to your local grade school, having taken an airplane ride from San Francisco or who knows where, 
uh, we could have a whole lot of measles like like we've and we've had outbreaks of measles in the past. You know, the COVID vaccine, probably among the things on the chart, is most like the influenza uh, outbreak in 1918. You know, there we think the reproduction number was two to three. Uh, and, you know, there you're, they were thinking you'd need to get 50 to 67% uh, of people um, immunized. Um, so, Herd immunity occurs when you get enough people, you don't have to get everyone, but you have to get a large part of a population immune to a specific disease. And when you get enough people resistant to the disease, it has no place to go. And this is really important for babies, for, for infants who can't be immunized for certain diseases, and for those that illnesses won't allow immunization or when you immunize some people, it just does not, it just doesn't work. So I want to, want to show you this sort of graphic re, uh, representation of, of herd immunity. Um, whoop, I lost it. Let's go back and try it again. Okay, so what I wanted to show you initially here, this is six different populations. Um, and, and across the top, you can see a, a population that had no percent of the people vaccinated, 25, 50%, and then across the bottom, 75 to 95%. There was a single black dot in each of these population, and that represented somebody who was infected. The, the yellow, uh, dots are those people that are vaccinated and the blue dots are those that are unvaccinated. And, and you get a feel, uh, you know, and this is probably for a disease like, like the measles or, or maybe whooping cough, where you have to get a fairly high uh, percentage of people immunized to really stop, stop the spread. The red lines are simply where it goes from one infected person to another, and you can see really quickly if you look in a population that has no experience with the disease, how it can go so so quickly, uh, how it can spread so rapidly, and that's exactly what happened with COVID. We don't think anybody in the whole world had any previous uh, experience with this virus, and so in a population where there's a low percentage. Um, uh, the disease goes wild. If you look down then to the 75% vaccinated, you can see uh, even, even early on, there's very little spread. And, and so, you know, one of the concepts I want you to take home here is that we talk about uh, reaching a certain percentage of people to, to reach herd immunity, but it has markedly positive effects along the way if, if you may not uh, stomp out all disease, but you can stomp out a whole lot of the disease by increasingly uh, getting that number up. Um, so what are the barriers to achieving herd immunity? Um, you know, we've talked about variants and, and we're particularly interested in the concept of variant escape. And that just means a variant that's become progressively resistant to vaccines. You know, and we talked about up front, this is a whole lot about uncertainty. And we really don't know, you know, what's coming next. We do know we have the capability to respond quickly to this, but one of the barriers in terms of getting to herd immunity is, is, is variants that spread quickly. Um, you know, vaccine hesitancy, and I've mentioned you know, I mentioned that. And, and if you don't get a, an adequate proportion of the population uh, vaccinated, you, you can't get there. Um, and then two huge question marks that we know very little about at this point in time is, what if the immunity from the vaccines that we put together or from natural disease is really short? You know, you can ask it the other way and be more optimistic is, you know, you know, will, will, if you've got uh, COVID last uh, 
July, will you be good for a couple of years if you got the disease or if you've got the Pfizer vaccine that, um, down at Two Rivers, will you be good for a couple of years? And those are things that we really don't know at this point in time. Um, you know, the other thing that is important for, for those of us who've gotten the vaccine now is, you know, will the vaccine prevent transmission of the virus? And that, and that simply means, you know, I've gotten, you, you've gotten the vaccine, but you get infected in your nose again. It doesn't spread, it doesn't make you sick, but could you give that to someone else? And we have some evidence now that that probably will not occur, but we really don't know the answer to that. And that's why vaccinated people getting on airplanes need to continue to wear masks, not so much to protect themselves, but to protect those who potentially you could give uh, the virus uh, to. Um, you know, the whole issue and the politicalization of mask wearing and social distancing and hand washing, you know, how well are we gonna do that? We're tired of this illness and it's easy to kind of drop our guard. And then, and then I want you to think again, you know, outside of Grand Junction and outside of the United States, the whole issue that's going on right now is that rich countries are buying out the world's supply of vaccine. And what does it mean that if you live in, in um, Africa and you know, there's no vaccine available um, and you continue to pass the disease around, you create new variants, then inevitably will we'll come uh, to Grand Junction. And I think I think it's you know it's ethically and morally you know a desert that you know that at this point in time you know we're not sharing our current supply with the world. Uh, I I I'm afraid that that may come back to haunt us. So the kid says, so let me get this straight: people in your country actually refuse vaccines. Um, you know, Dr. Fauci suggested that we need up to 85% or greater uh, penetrance of the vaccine to get herd immunity. Um, you know, I think my take right now is that herd immunity in the United States is, is not, not in the cards, um, probably for the United States or for the world uh, for a long time. And, and just like in the past, we've not really talk much. You saw it on the slide, but I, I don't think I've ever talked to anybody about herd immunity with, with influenza. And maybe, maybe the concept is that this um, COVID will become something that we'll learn to deal with like we deal with, with seasonal influenza, where that on the 1st of August, the sign will go up in front of the Safeway that your um, seasonal flu and your seasonal COVID uh, vaccine are, are now uh, available. So it, in the end, Sarah Zhang wrote this great article um, and I'd recommend it to you. She says, and I'll, I'll read this, in the analogy of the campfire, current epidemic's big. We might not have enough water to douse it completely. We might not be able to prevent sparks from catching, but the water we do have will still help. The fire will burn more slowly and cooler and every drop of water matters, you know? And I think she's saying, you know, what you and I do every day, you know, does, does matter. Um, so let's stop and talk about herd immunity. What questions or comments or thoughts do you all have? I'd like to know um, how, what percent of Mesa County has gotten at least one dose of the vaccine. Do you know those stats? I think that it's about 23%. And, and my source is the 530 news tonight, but and so <laughs> okay. they may not be dependable. Um, yeah, and they're, they're really gearing up. And I, I have good thoughts about how my colleagues at the health department 
have handled this. There have been some real problems of people being able to get in line and, and the, feed, the feedback that they've gotten frequently, which is no feedback, has been demoralizing and I, rep you know, I, I understand that. But I think in terms of they are really geared up now and I think they'll be able to deliver you know, every dose of vaccine that they, that they get. Um, and the word on the, that I heard earlier was that we might have gotten some Johnson and Johnson, uh, vaccine. I don't know. Any, any of I, you I get, can, I can answer that because I volunteer down at the clinic and yes, Tell we do. Yeah. Yeah. We, we gave out a lot of doses of Johnson and Johnson today. All first doses. Everyone who came in for a first dose, that's what they were offered. And only people coming in for their second dose got the Pfizer today. That's, that's great. And, you know, and, and uh, did we act like the uh, mayor of Detroit and send the Johnson & Johnson vaccine away? Or were people very accepting and happy to get the Johnson & Johnson vaccine? Um, yesterday, 50 people refused to take the Johnson & Johnson out of, I don't know, 800. Um, I don't know what the stats are today, but um, most people are very thrilled to come in and get, get it. And, and it's a very positive um, atmosphere down there. I mean, people are thrilled to be there. Yeah, that, that's great. Um, you know, and, and I'm sorry to hear that 50 out of, of 800, you know, refused it. I, I, you know, my opinion would be that that's, that's a mistake. And it's almost like uh, we get the numbers 95, you know, 95 percent just overwhelm things and anything that doesn't have a 95 on it is, can't be good. On the other hand, you know, I would argue that we have more experience, you know, the Johnson Johnson vaccine has more experience against uh, the variants that are, are more threatening. And, and so in some ways, um, you know, it, could it be a, a better vaccine in the short run or the long run? You know, I think we don't know. Other, yeah. other questions? Um, there is, um, Dr. Muller, there is a question from Pastor Kayla. She says she has some parishioners and family members who have lost uh, trust in the experts, including Dr. Fauci, because they felt that they have been lied to by experts. So they feel that they can't trust them. What would you say to them? Yeah, I, and, and Anthony Fauci has been criticized for things other than his poor pitching form. Um, remember, he threw out the first ball and it kind of landed halfway to them the plate. Um, and I, I would defend Dr. Fauci because I think, I think he's been intellectually honest. And it's just like the slide that I gave you that opened up, that what I tell you with, in a very pat way tonight may be patently wrong tomorrow. And Anthony Fauci's been there. And, you know, and I don't think there is a a uh, bone in his body that wants anything other than good things for the American people. Uh, but I hear that and, I, you know, and I've heard, heard that frequently. And one of my old family practice partners is, is always dogging on Anthony Fauci to me about how he's, he's changed his, his mind about things. And, but I would tell you that I think the science is changing all the time. And what you've heard tonight may be really, really wrong tomorrow. I mean, I just think that, um, I, I think he's a genuine person. I think the new uh, head of the CDC, Rochelle Walensky, comes with great credentials. And I, I have faith that she'll, she'll make good decisions for us. Um, there is also a thank you, um, Dr. Moore. There's also another question in the chat from Sue, who says she sees antibody testing being advertised. What's the purpose of this test, and do we need to be tested for antibodies down the road or before traveling? Yeah, uh, you know, 
the, the reason for antibody testing is for some laboratory to make money. There is no good reason to go get antibody tests that I can think of right now. We know that there is, uh, if, if you wanna figure out if the illness you had last July was, was COVID and you know a PCR test today would be negative, so you decide to go invest some money in, a, in an antibody test. You know, the antibody tests can be falsely positive, makes you think uh, that you had the disease when you really didn't. It can, it can show that you have some antibodies to the uh, coronavirus, but it says nothing about how effective those antibodies will be in terms of protecting you. And, and some people have used antibody tests when they decided they didn't want to get the second dose of the, the vaccine. Some places in Europe are using antibody tests to be able to get on an airplane. That is the worst kind of science. And so in, in my mind, you know, antibody tests may, may prove to be a value in the future, but, but right now I think there's no good reason to get um, tested for antibodies. Phil, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Gartraud, good to well, see I, you. Sorry, I've been fooling with my screen. I've had some problems. So do I hear you saying that international travel is not a good thing to look at for what, one, two years, three years? Uh, I don't know. I, in just a minute, Gertrud, I'll show you what the CDC says. And okay. I'll show you what some people that have much more expertise than I do. Thank you. Uh, but yeah, and that, and... Um, I, I think it's more optimistic than you just stated it, but let, let's go ahead and I'll show you that. You, you know, it's now uh, 7.30 and I appreciate your forbearance and certainly feel free to uh, drop out. We're, we're not taking names and I appreciate the fact that you would all come. Um, let's talk a little bit about incentives and mandates. You know, there's some uh, companies in the United States that are now offering financial and other incentives to their employees for getting the vaccine. And, um, you know, companies can mandate that you get the vaccine to work. And we know about that, you know, uh, healthcare institutions make the nurses in, in uh, nurseries get certain vaccines to protect um, infants. Uh, if you talk to, uh, HR people, they think this is a very bad idea, that it's probably not an ethical uh, good idea. And our president has said that he would not support a federal requirement that people be vaccinated. Whether or not what will happen with kids, I think, remains to be seen. You know, in this country, we have a long uh, tradition and, uh, of immunizing our kids against a lot of infectious uh, diseases. Um, you know, good news is now that, you know, at least three or four of the companies that have come out with an initial vaccine are now testing those vaccines in younger and younger uh, children. And, you know, so probably by the fall or into the winter, we'll have, uh, an, um, uh, you know, some vaccines available for progressively um, younger kids. Um, Remember John Delaney, he was the guy who was always on the end at the debates. Um, he was the governor, I think, of Maryland. He's proposed that we give everybody a $1,500 check who gets the vaccine. Um, I think it's a really bad idea. I, you know, my own feeling is we have, <clears throat> we have an ethical obligation to get vaccinated to protect not only ourselves, but our community. <clears throat> It may not be coercion, but I think to some people it would certainly feel like it. Um, I think, I think you know, in the long run, you know, a fairly high percentage of people will get vaccinated, and so it's not a good financial investment. And then finally, I think that carries the message that man, if you're going to give me fifteen hundred bucks to get this shot, you know, what's wrong with it, or you know, what, you know, what's going to happen to me, and you know, did Bill Gates really put the microchip in it and, and that kind of thing? Um, you know, talk a little bit about passports and this to, to your questions, 
we're proud. You know, we've had uh, yellow fever passports forever, you know, for a lot of places in the world uh, to, to get in to those countries, you have to have had uh, uh, a yellow fever uh, vaccination. <clears throat> and we know both in our country and in the European Union and the UK, that there's consideration now developing passports uh, to show that you've either been vaccinated and, you know, and in some places right now, they're you show you have to show that you don't have a current infection. That's true coming back in the United States of America today that um, you have to prove that you're you have with a negative um, PCR test. The people that are really championing this, and I totally understand this, are, are, is the travel industry, uh, the Chamber of Commerces of the world, you know, are pushing the concept because they see this as a way to open their, their economies back up. <clears throat> and, you know, President Biden, and actually in, in terms of one of his first executive orders, you know, has asked some government agency to, to study the concept of digital passports. Um, we talked about, I just mentioned the fact that some countries, you know, require uh, getting in or get, getting out that you would have to have the vaccine. And, and so, you know, you want to go to, uh, you know, the World Series, you want to go to a big concert in Denver, you want to go back uh, to church, you know, should the vaccine be uh, considered <clears throat> uh, a ticket to, to, to these kind of things? And so this, this brings us to the second question. This is the Church of the Wildwood. Um, I had to look up, I, I'm trying to make this question cutesy. And so I thought about that song, hymn. Um, trivia, this, this um, song was written in 1854 by a physician who was traveling through Iowa. He went into this little veil there was no church there when he wrote the song, <clears throat> but years later he came back and actually uh, worked in that community and uh, he wrote, wrote the song about uh, the church in the Wildwood. So here, here's my question to each of you, including our at least two pastors online. You're the pastor of the church in the Wildwood. The council's voting on whether to mandate that church members will have to receive a COVID vaccine to attend in-person services. Three of your council members strongly favor their vaccine. Three are vehemently opposed. It's your turn to vote. And you vote A, to require the COVID vaccine to attend services or not to require the COVID vaccine <clears throat> to attend services. So what I'd like you to do again, if you can, Put it into the chat, either say uh, yes, meaning you would require vaccine or uh, B, uh, not to require a vaccine, uh, say yes or, or no. Um, and then we'll tabulate those, get Matthew to do that. You know, the opposition to COVID passports is primarily <clears throat> from physicians who, you know, had like myself, we're really uncertain about um, how well the vaccine is going to prevent passing infection to others, uh, the issues of the variants that we've talked about, the issues of how long <clears throat> the vaccine will work, how long will uh, having had the disease uh, protect you. And then the, ethic, the ethicists and, <coughs> excuse me, the people at the World Health Organization who really think that this is um, uh, discriminatory, that um, the World Health Organization's comment is it's not possible, it's impossible to have immunity passports which don't result in human rights uh, abuses. So uh, with that in mind, what, what questions do you all have? <clears throat> or comments, I'm interested in your thoughts. Um, um, Dr. Um, Pastor Kayla is asking a clarifying question. Are you requiring the pastor to also have the vaccine? Oh, that's for sure. 
I would assume, or not. Say again. Yeah. I, I'm sorry, I didn't follow Gail. Tell me okay, again. So uh, she was asking a clarifying question. I mean, it was like A or B, uh, would you ask all the prisoners to have a vaccine? Would the pastor also be included in having to have the vaccine as well? Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. Can you try once more? I'm having a little trouble understanding. Okay, so um, the question was, um, well, Pastor Kelly asked, would the question also apply to the pastor? Would the pastor, uh, yes, the pastor should have a vaccine or no? Oh, I, I get you. Sure, yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, the pastor, I guess, is would be a yes or no, too. Part of the, part of the same question. The pastor, pastor is the shepherd of the flock, so absolutely. So other, other questions about passports, <clears throat> you know, there's some, some, you know, strange things going on in terms of <clears throat> people having to prove, uh, uh, you know, that they're not infected. My wife and I gone to Kauai and Hawaii for several years. And so about a month ago, I got this intense desire to go there and and to go to Kauai now, you <clears throat> have to go and totally isolate for ten days, meaning you cannot leave your apartment or hotel room uh, for ten days. On on the eighth day, you get tested. If your test is negative, then then you're free to go, or you can go to uh, what's called a bubble hotel for four days, uh, where on the third day you get tested and the, you know, the bubble hotels all cost uh, $800 a night. Um, and, and so, you know, some really complicated rules about travel, even, you know, within our own country right now. They don't want you. We have yeah. results on our test, on our uh, quiz. I believe David has a question for a script. Far yeah, away, David. We can get the results of the quiz first. Um, yep, yep. It's about 95% uh, no. Uh, so B. Um, there's a few kind of A's. Um, if it was in church, in church, then uh, yes. But if it's just online, then no. But okay. other than that, everybody said no. Yeah. Go ahead, David. Uh, what about more expansive travel? Um, you know, selfishly, we oh. want to know if we can go see oh, Emily sorry. and Jeremy in Wisconsin and New Jersey. And then we've canceled all of our exotic international trips. Uh, and we want to know when we realistically could think about going someplace overseas. Yeah. You know, right now, and I'll, I'll show you in just, just a minute, you know, the CDC guidelines that came out, um, I guess, just just today, you know, part of it is really good. Part of it, they stand pat on that, that we should not fly domestically or internationally at this point in time. Um, and that if you do fly, you know, don't fly if you're sick and, you know, those those kind of things. Let, let if are, are there other questions? And, and I'll, I'll, I'll further answer your, hopefully answer your question, David. You know, I, I would just, I, I would tell you that I gave that same quiz about the church in the Wildwood to a group of, of, of folks from New Dimensions. These are folks who uh, are all over 50 and that group, like this group, is mostly immunized. When I asked them the question about would you require um, immunization to, to open your church back up, 74% voted in favor that they would make that requirement. So I, I think a fascinating sort of difference, difference of minds um, in terms of that. Let, let's go ahead and talk about the post-vaccine era. And Yogi Berra is my favorite 
um, philosopher. Um, and Yogi, many of you may have um, seen this quote by Yogi before. It's, he said, it's tough to make predictions, especially about the future. But when I was looking that quote up, I found this one that I think is even more pertinent. And it's the future ain't what it used to be. And I think, boy, that really struck home with me about, you know, the future ain't what it used to be. So this is an answer to what will my life look like after COVID vaccination? Short answer is it's not a get out of jail free card. Um, it, it's not carte blanche to go do whatever. And um, I, would, I would say to you that I think, you know, I think about the last year and my own behavior, it really is a, a complicated risk benefit assessment. And it really depends a whole lot on how risk adverse you are. And I would tell you as a physician, I'm pretty risk adverse. And, and, you know, and my situation with my wife and I makes me even more uh, uh, risk adverse. Um, the other thing I would say to you is what you're gonna see here is a whole lot of opinion uh, rather than in fact, and, and whether you're looking in the popular literature, your newspaper, or your favorite magazine, or your favorite um, news program, um, there, there's not a lot of fact. And only today, you know, did the CDC come out with any solid uh, advice. And so uh, a lot of this is, is really opinion, and the opinions are all over the place, as you'll see. Um, you know, one of the things that will help answer this are some of the questions that we've talked about before. You know, can vaccinated people pass the disease on? Uh, at this point in time, some evidence, like I pointed out before, suggests that you won't. So that, you know, that's potentially good news. How much protection will the vaccines offer against the transmissible variants? And, and again, a lot of unknowns there. Um, some good news from the initial studies that I showed you, the first 75,000 uh, folks, really good news. Um, what's the prevalence of COVID illness in our community? And, you know, and, and uh, right now it, it looks good, but that's something to keep in mind. And it's also what you ought to keep in mind when you're gonna go visit um, someplace far away. After I looked at going to uh, Hawaii, and that didn't sound like a good idea. I looked at going to Gulf Shores, Alabama, where Nancy and I have gone a couple of times. And it, you know, thinking about that white, nice white sand beach, and yet uh, the COVID rate in that community was, was over the top, and their ICUs were full. And so that's a trip that didn't happen. You know, we've talked about before, we don't know long, how long uh, vaccine immunity will last. And, and if you get the disease, we know from South Africa that, that, um, that some folks have gotten two different variants of the disease within a period of six months. So it's not clear about immunity. And how well do, will we continue to wear masks with, with COVID fatigue? Um, you know, and, and I've shown you this before, we know that the vaccines are, the ones that are probably gonna be available to us are really effective against severe disease, hospitalization and death. And that, that's the great news. Um, so here are some actual quotes. Um, I'll be comfortable going to the dentist and getting my hair cut after I'm fully immunized. I will not dine indoors with people outside of my own family household until the prevalence of disease falls. Uh, my favorite bar is still not on my agenda. This person says flying with a mask is far less of a risk after inoculation. Um, time to catch up and have your colonoscopy. Um, and a, a, a couple wanting to get together with another fully vaccinated couple are fine to do so, including hugs. Nancy and I did that with some church friends 
in the last week. And that sure felt good. You know, I think things like gyms and bars and small room meetings, wherever it is, you know, you really need to think about how many people are in the room, how well do, well do they wear their mask, what the ventilation is like. I think those are potential areas where people can get into trouble. Uh, this person says normal is a long time away. If you want zero risk travel, you will have to wait a very long time. Uh, in answer to your question, Gertrude, international travel will be realistic by the fall, by the end of the year. Um, and in, in terms of David's questions about travel to Europe will be available by the end of the year, but travel to Africa, South America, and parts of Asia or in the distant future. These are opinions of people that uh, you know, should be smart about it, but they're only opinions. And then uh, I guess this was yesterday that the CDC news came through. Uh, and, and this is really good news. If you were a grandparent, um, you can gather uh, indoors with unvaccinated people from one other household. So I can now go hug my um, uh, unvaccinated grandkids who are healthy. You know, and the, and the requirement there is that you don't want to uh, go hug people or uh, expose people that, you know, are at increased risk for severe COVID disease. Um, you can gather indoors with fully vaccinated people without wearing a mask. Um, and some feel like the CDC has been really slow to uh, come forth with these and that they're sort of piddly recommendations, although if, if you've waited to hug your grandkids for a long time, it's not a piddly recommendation. Um, if you've been around with someone who has COVID, uh, uh, you, you don't need to stay away from others or get tested unless you become symptomatic. So those, those are the things that came through today. And I think you'll see, and I think it's the same kind of reason why some folks don't feel that Dr. Fauci is, is reputable or they've lost faith in him is that the CDC is being slow because we don't know a, a lot of the answers to the, to the question. The things that haven't changed, you know, you still need to wear your mask. Uh, you still need to socially distance. You ought to stay out of crowds and poorly ventilated spaces. Uh, you ought to, you know, use precautions when you're in public or when you're with other unvaccinated people that are unvaccinated from more than one household. And, you know, and particularly if you're visiting with someone who's unvaccinated, who's increased risk of, of dying from COVID, you certainly want to wear your mask. And then finally, um, avoiding medium or large size gatherings. Um, you know, they specifically say you should delay domestic and international travel. And if you do travel, you know, the CDC requirements are, you know, obviously don't get on an airplane if you're sick. Um, you know, I think you need to continue to watch for symptoms of COVID if you've been vaccinated, particularly if you're around someone who is sick. You know, 95% is is great, but it's not 100% and nothing's 100%. And if you do develop symptoms of COVID, you should go get tested and stay home. Um, and then whatever guidelines you have in your workplace, the CDC says you should follow them. Um, so I, you know, I think I think our view of the world should expand. We should be really interested about what's happening all over the world because it really does have meaning for what happens here. If you've got your immunization record, you should make a whole bunch of copies of it because you may need it to travel to Nuremberg or Copenhagen or the Republic of Boulder. Um, and I guess one thing that I hope that our new president and and our Congress uh, finally gets through their head that public health, uh, supporting public health is as important as supporting the military. 
Um, you know, there's some doomsday people that said this is will not be the last of of the pandemics. And so, uh, you know, I think we've got some great new tools now, uh, but we need the money to 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 buy those tools. Um, you know, wash your hands, social distance, keep an eye on what the prevalence of the disease is. And then the other thing is if you're past two weeks, past your last shot and you get exposed, uh, you won't need to quarantine, you just monitor yourself for, for a couple of weeks. So I, I think that's everything. Uh, questions or comments? Answer your question, Gertrude, and David. Phil? Yes. Phil? Yes. I had actually not planned to listen in on this because the questions that people had, I thought I had pretty much heard on the news or reading or whatever, and they were not questions that I needed answered. But you have come up with some wonderful, wonderful stuff. And um, I'm so glad I sat in on it. Well, well, thank you, Gertrude. You're very kind. And no, you're, it's just the way it is. I'll put your check in the mail in the morning. Thank you. <laughs> Um, and, and Dr. Mueller also, um, it looks like there's lots of accolades for you. Um, really appreciating your, your time and knowledge in the chat. They're yes. talking and uh, um, actually Mark, Mark Hinkle said that when he grows up, he wants to be half as knowledgeable as, as you are. Um, so there we are. So we have lots of people that are just really appreciative of your time and, and efforts. Oh, good. So thank you. Well, thank you all for investing the time. I thank you, Dr. Mueller. Uh -huh. Thank you. And Good please night. join us next Tuesday night at 630 as we focus on our emotional and spiritual health with presenters of Reverend Wendy Jones. Uh, she's a minister of the Unitarian Church and Chaplain Dan Wilkie of Hope West. Good night, everybody. Good night. And Yes, it is. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Moore. Sure. We're all done.